You know, at Jesus Community Church, we've been having communion the same way since I've been here. With very few exceptions, we always pass everything back and forth, and yet never once has anybody dropped it. <laughs> and that, that to me is an amazing thing, especially since we often have the children here with us, and children being children touch everything, especially what you don't want them to touch. And it, it just amazes me each week. Now that I've said that, we're going to depend on God's grace that this goes forward. Uh, I spoke last week about getting back into the habit of doing testimonies. I think this is something that's necessary in the body to build one another up, to, to help us be part of each other. You know, everybody has a story. I love that saying, if you would take the time to listen, everybody has a story. And it's through testimonies that we begin to share in each other's story. It's through fellowship that your story and my story can become one story. And so, um, to get us started, I've asked Christy to come and share her testimony. Now, I, I have been seeking you guys out and asking you. I'm not going to do that. I, I want those of you who would be willing to share your testimony to come and talk to Christy or I. So that we can get you uh, down on a Sunday so that you can come and share your testimony. This is something that encourages and blesses the body of Christ. So even if you've done it before, it's been several years since we've made the round, I would like you to do it again because we have new people and your story should have grown. There should be more to your story now. So Christy, if you would be willing to come up. Elijah. Everybody say hi, Elijah. Hi. <laughs> yeah, last week Glenn mentioned you know, if anybody wants to give their testimony, talk to Christy or I. And so he asked me later, did anybody talk to you? Nope. Nobody <laughs> talked to me either. So guess who got asked to do their testimony? <laughs> Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. No, actually, I'm, I am very excited because um, I'm very excited about being able to talk about the Lord and what he has done. And um, he's done amazing things in me against all odds, and it's been a really interesting, interesting journey. Um, I was raised in church. My parents went to church all the time. My mom, my grandmother played organ for the church. My mom played organ and piano for the church. And so my mom at least was there every Sunday. Um, it was not a church that um, really taught salvation. I didn't really know a lot, of, I didn't know anything about salvation actually. Um, and it, it just taught about God being loving and kind and accepting and kind of believe whatever you want to believe about the Bible. Jesus is a great guy and you need to be like him, that kind of a thing. But, um, and even though when I was growing up I didn't have a, a close relationship with my dad um, at all, um, somehow God bypassed that because a lot of times we get our impression of God from our fathers. I, for some reason I've always just had this, this awareness of God being a very loving father. I always felt like I was welcome to come to him and sit on his lap at any time. Um, and I didn't learn about salvation until I was about 16. As I was going through my childhood, um, I, I didn't have very many friends. I was quiet and awkward. And, um, every once in a while, I would end up with one friend, and God always made sure it was a Christian. And that person would take me to church with her. And when I was 16, my friend at the time took me to um, a, a, Bible, a youth group meeting, and we watched the movie Thief in the Night. You guys remember that? I don't remember anything about the movie, except when I got done, it was like, oh my gosh, I better make sure I'm in, because this is serious stuff. So they did an altar call at the end, and I went down. In my mind, I was rededicating my life to Christ. But um, God showed me later that was actually really my salvation. And the first time I really understood that I had to repent and I had to give my life to him. But I didn't really get very serious about my faith until about my third year of college. I was about 20 or so. And God had me living in a very, very strange place on the earth called Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> and you guys know Boulder. I was going to college there, and um, it's a weird place. But while I was there, I went to a thing with my friend who was a Christian who... Um, uh, the speaker was talking about a walk he was taking and how God was speaking to him and how God was leading him and how he had an interaction with God where like they would communicate with each other. That was the first time I'd ever heard of, you can have, you can, because me, I loved God, but he was like up there and I was here. 
and I'm all of a sudden I'm discovering I can be that close, like he can talk to me, he talks to people, that's amazing. I thought that was so cool. So that led me into this incredible, incredibly energetic search to figure out how God was talking to me. And I ended up looking back, calling it my blue lightning days, because um, I thought God was talking to me in everything. And I tried to manipulate ways that God was talking to me. I learned about Gideon and how he put out the fleece. And I decided, oh, I want to know what if, if this answer is yes or no. So I'm going to go out. And I remember that, living at the dorms in Boulder and going out and putting rocks in a certain position. If the answer is yes, then tomorrow morning I'm going to come back and the rocks are going to be moved. And if it's no, I'm going to come back and they're going to be moved this way. And I was so excited, completely believing that was going to happen. Got up the next morning the rocks were exactly the way I left them. Oh, that's really discouraging. I used to sit outside with my Bible, outside in the wind in Boulder. <laughs> God, show me what you want me to read and let the wind blow the pages and then read. Now, not to say that God didn't use some of those things, because he did. Sometimes he led me to some incredible things when the wind blew the pages. And there's still, almost every morning, when I get up in the morning, I just open up my Bible. There's something right there on that page that speaks to me for that day. So not all of that is, was really frivolous. But in that process, God was teaching me how to hear his voice. I made a lot of mistakes, but I was learning too. So in that process, I learned that God wanted me to um, study music. I was up and down and back and forth and all kinds of things in college and felt like he wanted me to study music, specifically church music. So I ended up at a college in Oklahoma where Glenn was. Um, we didn't really meet each other there. He, we kind of knew who each other was because we were from similar churches and um, he, he thought I was weird. But keep in mind, I was in Boulder, Colorado. That's weird. I think he still thinks I'm weird, but he married me anyway. So that's a good thing. So anyway, we, we, we got married, and when you graduate, both of us graduated with a, a degree from a Bible college, when you walk into a church with a Bible college degree, you're put to work immediately. So every single church we've ever been to in our entire lives, you walk in the door, unless it's a huge church and you can be anonymous, as soon as they know, oh, you graduated from Southwestern, well, you can teach this class and you can do worship, and all the churches we went to at the time, they had three Sunday services, sun, or three services in a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and of course, with, with me being able to do music, I was there all the time, doing music all the time, years and years and years and years and years and years and years. Um, when I look back on that time, and that the characteristics of my walk, I would really say I, I lived a lot in his grace. I had a tremendous understanding of his grace, that he would just forgive me, and he would carry me, and he would love me, and it was, it, it was very wonderful in that regard, but I also became very, very stagnant. Um, we were really, really, really busy in church all the time, but my walk was really, really dry, and I could get up and do worship three times a week and sing something wonderfully and teach Sunday school or lead a youth group and just be really dry, and that's how it was for years and years and years. Last time I gave my testimony here was actually Mother's Day of 2013, and uh, wow, a lot has happened since Mother's Day of 2013. <laughs> like Glenn said, your story should have grown from there. I think I've had more growth in my spiritual walk from that point to now than probably my entire life combined. It's been amazing. Um, he's taken me into a time when I got, a couple of years before that, when he, I realized my walk has been dry and stagnant and it's all about grace, and he needs to start growing me up a little bit. When I finally made that turn, okay, let's get serious, it's like hyper-maturity that he grew in me. You gotta learn this, you gotta learn this, you gotta learn this. And um, it hasn't been easy, but um, you know, Jesus is a redeemer, and one of the things that he redeems, I really believe, is time. Because I look back on a lot of the years that I feel like I've wasted, and um, he's able to take stuff and fix it so that he even redeems time. Somewhere in the past, maybe seven years ago or so, I, I ended up praying this prayer as I was kind of turning. And the prayer was, I just want you, Jesus, and everything you want for me, nothing more and nothing less. And I remember praying that over and over and over again, really turning my heart in that direction. And then kind of getting excited because what's God going to do? You know, you tell him you can do anything. He's going to do something really cool. And during that time, Glenn started pastoring here, so I had some opportunities come up. I could start teaching women a little bit. That was cool. I, I had more opportunities to worship, but God was kind of healing the way I did worship, so it was more um, honest and not just a show. And all of that was really good, and I'm getting really excited about what is he going to call me to do? This is going to be really cool. Well, I, I kept a journal for a few years in there. One During that time, when I was praying that, I read back in a, a journal that I kept in July of 2010. And in the midst of these things that were going on the day, I wrote one sentence that I don't even remember writing, and it said, I feel like God wants me wants to show me what he wants to do, and then I'm supposed to pray until it comes to pass. And then I put a note like the Galaxy Quest lady, question mark, and it just went on. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Galaxy Quest. 
it's a, it's a comedy show that makes fun of shows like Star Trek. You know, like on those space shows, you have a, a person that always repeats the computer. Well, in the Galaxy Quest movie, there's one character, and all she does in the movie is repeat the computer. Like that, do they ask if there's something on board, and she will ask, and, and then the computer will repeat, and she will repeat what the computer says. At one point, one guy says, I know, I heard the computer. And she says, I have one job on this ship. It's stupid, but I'm going to do it. That's exactly what I thought of this. Because it's kind of like, to me, that was like an unnecessary middleman. God says, I want to heal so-and-so. Okay, so I pray, God, please heal so-and-so. And God heals so-and-so. To me, that's just kind of down at the time. <laughs> I'm not necessary in that. God can just do whatever he wants to do. Anyway, so I kind of blew that off out of my mind. Um, but then when January 2014 rolled around, it became increasingly clear that God, to me, that God was calling me to intercession. And when I realized that, I was kind of bummed. It sounded really boring. <laughs> I didn't want to be this Galaxy Quest lady that just repeated things. And obviously, I thought, okay, if this is really what God has for me, it's got to be more than what I'm thinking because he's, he's not that kind of a God. Looking at that point, when I look back, um, he was already working that kind of thing in me. I um, remember in 2010, um, God speaking to me that he wanted Glenn to be the pastor of this church. And there were some things developing along that line, but that was a two-year journey of praying when it didn't look like that was going to happen, and things, weird things happening in our lives that were, were upsetting, and I had to hold on by faith. This is what God wants. This is what's going to happen. And at times when I didn't think it was going to. Um, I, he also, God reminded me actually recently, he actually started this journey for me in 1992. I remember um, Benjamin was a little baby, so we had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a newborn, and God was telling me I was working full-time, had four little kids, and Glenn was full-time in school and working full-time, and he wanted me to get up early in the morning and pray for my family which I thought was a really dumb idea. I don't have enough time, doesn't he know how exhausted I am? So I did it at least one day, I may have done it two days. He wanted me to pray five minutes for each for Glenn, Christopher, Donovan, and Benjamin. 20 minutes, <clears throat> wow. That's, and so I did it one day, I probably did it more than once, I don't think it was more than a week. But during that time, he, I not only prayed for them, he actually kind of showed me some things that he wanted to pray for children that we didn't have yet, for Mackenzie and Thaddeus which was interesting, and for some reason I just stopped and didn't do that. Well, between 1992 and 2014, when he brought this up again, it was 22 years, and I think, what was I doing for 22 years? You know, he started this back then, and I just sort of dropped it. But I'm starting to see already things, even that I prayed back then, that I rem I'm reminded that he prayed coming to pass in my kids. But remember, like what I said, Jesus is a redeemer. He's even a redeemer of time. And I really believe that when we repent and we yield to him and his plans for us, he can take lost time and he can even take our mistakes and he can work them into the beautiful tapestry that he has planned for our lives. And we don't have to worry about feeling like we missed it or we've lost something. Um, this morning I felt like that, that God told me that there were some of you guys that needed to hear that, so I'm going to say that again. That when we repent and we yield to him and his plans for us, he can take lost time and even our mistakes and you can weave them into the beautiful tapestry that he has planned for us today. We don't need to worry about that we've missed it because we can always be brought back to where we need to be. So what have I learned? The main thing I've learned is that what God has called me to is the most fulfilling, exciting thing I can do because that is what I was created to do. And there's so much height and depth and substance to God that... Um, there is no way we could ever tap it out. There is no way that, that, work, that going with him in the fullness of whatever it is that he's called us to would be dry or boring or lifeless. It's very, very fulfilling. And what he has in mind for us goes far beyond anything that we can think or ask or imagine, like he says in his word. It's not, it's not the Galaxy Quest lady. It's, it's way much more than that. Um, he's taught me a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I could write a book on what he's taught me. Maybe I will someday. Um, but there's two primary ways that he has taught me all the lessons that I have learned in this journey. The main one is through his word and his spirit, which work hand in hand. Because when I came into this calling to be an intercessor, um, there were things that he asked me to pray for and ways that he asked me to pray that I had not seen examples of and I didn't know how to do and I wasn't sure. There, was not, not, there wasn't a book I could pick up to read that really explained things and I just had to go to him. And so there would be times when he would 
prompt me something in my spirit, and then I would find something in the Word that confirmed it, and then we would go that direction, and there would be times when he would show me something in the Word, and then he would play that out in my life through his spirit, and we would go that direction. And I've noticed that over the last few years, when I learn a lesson through his spirit and his Word, once I get that down, almost invariably, if it's, a, if it's an important lesson, he will lead me to a speaker or a book or somebody who's had the same experience that teaches the same thing. Which if I had gotten that first, it wouldn't have been nearly as effective. Just knowing that this is what he spoke to me, this is what he's leading me to do, and it's been confirmed by what he's been speaking to other people too, which is really encouraging. But this whole process has made it so that I pressed into him. Instead of pressing into a book to learn how to do this, I've had to press into him to find out how to do it. I realized it's a really important job. And I've had to take that to him and say, I, have no, I know this is important, but I don't know how to do this. I don't know what you're asking of me. I'm not sure how this is supposed to play out. So that's been the number one way that he has taught me. The other way that he has taught me has been through difficulties and through trials. And unfortunately, I don't really see anywhere in the Bible where anybody who's really grown in their walk with God and become what God wants them to be that has not gone through difficulties. We're, we're told in Peter that we're called to suffer. And I don't think that's just in persecution. I think that means him just working all the ick out of our lives. Um, a lot of my trials were brought on by my stupid choices, my years of just living in grace and not dealing with things in my life that I should have dealt with and having that explode and, and affect me and my family. And, um, and, but some of my trials were brought on by my obedience. God can use both. <laughs> he can use my mistakes, work them to grow something good in my life, and he can bring stuff into my life. That, that, and I'm obedient, and it brings things that he grows me. Um, <coughs> What have my trials done for me? They have revealed my greatest weaknesses. I never knew how angry I could get <laughs> until I started going through some of these things. I never knew how despairing or hopeless I could feel until I started going through some of these things. I didn't realize how, much, how little faith I had. I didn't realize how much I tended to wallow in my sin without guilt or remorse until God started bringing that out of me. I didn't realize how much I didn't trust God. As much as I loved him, I thought I trusted him, and I realized I really didn't. Not as much as I thought I did. I also realized that God has given me children that are much better people than I am. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but when I was going through some of these dark times, my kids would come to me with things, incredible words of faith and wisdom that were way beyond their years. I certainly didn't impart that to them. That's just a gift that, that he's given me because I needed that. Um, and through this whole thing, realizing that I spent my life resting in grace and I needed to grow up because um, I've learned that grace is not just for, it's not just for the purpose of forgiving us of our sins. Grace is also for the purpose to give us what we need to overcome our sin. It actually says that in Titus chapter 2. And I know I've read this verse many, many times, but just one day it just jumped out at me. Titus 2, 11 through 12 says something to the effect, his grace has been given us at this time so that we can learn to say no to sin. It's not there so that we can continue to sin. It's there so that we can have something to help us overcome sin because we can't do it on our own. The trials have also driven me to him because when he started this journey, um, March of 2014, he wanted me to get up at a certain time. He wanted me to spend a certain amount of time. And he told me, I don't care what time you go to bed, you get up at this time. Okay, well, no big deal. I'll just go to bed early all the time. And then things changed and then there was upheaval in my life and there were many sleepless nights and I still had to get up and pray. And um, the trials get, got me to a point where I just absolutely had to have him. And if I didn't have him, I, I did, literally some days thought I was going to die. And I, I had to go to him every single day. God, if you, if you don't meet me here, I'm going to be nothing. What are you doing? What's happening? Why is this happening? And so it got me to a point where I just was driven to him. And that was so necessary because he wanted me close to him. So sometimes he entices us to come and we come. Sometimes when that doesn't work, he pushes us and drives us until we come. But the point is that he wants us there. I learned what an intercessor is. It's not somebody who just sits and prays all day long. There's aspects to it, and there are multiple, multiple examples in Scripture of intercession that, that we don't ever think about as being intercess intercession. But an intercessor is somebody who stands in the gap between a person or a circumstance and God. And there's two parts to that. You take whatever is going on in the person or the circumstance and you bring it to God. And the other part to that is you discern from God what he wants to do, and then you pray that that will come to pass. It's a twofold thing. And what, what that requires 
is that you have to have an intimacy with God. That to me has become the most incredible thing that, that I'm shocked that he would want from me is that intimacy because, um, because to be intimate with God requires holiness, right? Not perfect, but increasingly holiness. We have his righteousness, but if we have ongoing sin in our life, it blocks our fellowship, and so we can't have the intimacy. And when I was supposed to be coming to him and learning how he wanted me to pray, he kept bringing these things up in my life that, that he had to work out because he wanted that intimacy. So I was really surprised that he would use me in this because he knew how I'd just been kind of wallowing in my sins for so many years. But his thing is, I'm, I'm going to use you in spite of yourself, and we're going to help you get over this. He's still helping me get over that. I haven't succeeded yet, but increasingly. There's still a lot of things he's working out in me, and I think, like all of you, he works something out, and then all of a sudden you turn a corner, and there's something else, and then you turn a corner, and there's something else. It's an ongoing process. Makes you wonder why he even bothers. The other part of it is that... I'm learning that part of intercession is to pray for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in order to do that, you have to know his will, and you have to declare his will. And he's given me kind of a picture of me coming to him in his throne room, because I'm allowed to come there, and so are you, and presenting my petitions to him and hearing from him what he wants to bring to pass. And then it's like I leave the throne room and I stand on the edge <coughs> at looking out to his kingdom, and I declare, decree what he wants to bring to pass. And um, that has become an amazing thing that I'm, I'm still learning to grow in. But another reason that I felt like it was odd that he would use me in this is because that's truth that you're speaking, right? And me, as a, as a person, it's like from the day I learned how to talk, it seemed like I learned how to lie at the same time. And throughout my lifetime, lying has been kind of my crutch for a win. When I need to present myself in a better light or I need to protect myself from getting in trouble, and why in the world would you use somebody who had a propensity to not speak truth to so boldly speak truth? That just goes again with, he doesn't call us to things that we're capable of doing. He just makes us capable of doing. So some of the trials that happened in my life were a result of the ick and my stuff that he had to work out. And some were a result of him answering my prayer to do and have everything, be everything that he's called me to be. Um, so then I had an amazing time starting in 2014. Um, I don't know if you guys remember in April that month that he, that he almost died. Um, and then he didn't. I remember being up at the emergency room and the doctor was like, his heart is racing and he's not getting any oxygen. His oxygen saturation is really low and I don't know what's wrong with him. I don't know. Anyway, he recovered, as you can tell. <laughs> and on the way home from the hospital that night, God brought to mind that scripture in Hebrews 11 that says something to the effect of, women received their husbands back from the dead. I felt like that's what God had done. And that time period there was um, amazing. The spirit and presence of God in our home and in our, in our marriage was just incredible as he was just doing something. In the midst of that, that something was born that ended up creating a lot of difficulty as well. And um, we, it was, Glenn and I both knew that it was from God but it seemed it was unusual and it was unprecedented and it stirred up a lot of struggle. And um, we had to keep going to him and asking him, is this from you? Is this right? Is this what you want? And God was amazing in the ways that he confirmed it. He confirmed it to, to Glenn with shooting stars, confirmed it to me with incredible demonstrations of discernment to be aware of things that I would not have been aware of through the spirit. He even had another godly man um, speak to us or speak to Glenn and tell him, I've been praying about this for you because I don't understand it, and God told me in a voice that as clear as I've ever heard him say anything, you don't have to understand it, I'm, I'm doing it. So we had to hold on to that because the journey was not easy, and um, it caused a lot of chaos and struggle and upheaval, and a lot of that was because I didn't handle things right. I didn't trust God as I was learning. I didn't um, wait for God as I was learning I needed to do, um, and I just reacted. You know how when something bad happens, you just react? I'm learning to just keep my mouth shut and not react to things and let God do things. Um, but God was also using it. Part of the reason he brought it into our lives is a tool to remodel our life, our, our marriage especially, which really needed a lot of remodeling. At one point, I remember asking God, I don't know why you have done this, because this is going to destroy our marriage. And he said to me, I have done this because your marriage is strong enough. You know, he's the God who calls things that are not as though they are. <laughs> that was definitely something that was not at that time. Really? I don't see that, God. I'm glad you see that because I don't see that, but I'm seeing that now. And I want to tell you something about Glenn that you guys need to know. 
He is a man of commitment. He had committed to be stay married to me and to love me. And that has been tested. I have tested that with stupid, stupid stuff that I have done and continue to do. God has tested that by bringing something. Oh, yeah? Well, what if I call, require this of her? Are you still going to stay committed to her and love her? And he has passed the test so far. I would imagine that he's going to continue to. Because I'm hoping that all that bad stuff is behind us. Anyway, back to this guy. So he's growing me in intercession. He's teaching me about the galaxy quest thing, but it's really bigger than that. And I'm trying to figure out how to do this. We go to Israel. One of the first places that we went was Mount Carmel. And I was really still jet lagged and it was, I was tired, but we went up to the top of and Mount Carmel, you know, was one of the things that happened there was when Elijah did the battle with the, with the other prophets. And um, the, our teacher, Randy Weiss, was talking about intercession. I thought, what does intercession have to do with Elijah? He was saying that he prayed this 15 minute, 15 word prayer at the top of the, the mountain for the fire to come down, but he said that's not where it started. Where it started was all the intercession that he did beforehand. And he gave us all these examples of how God would show Elijah what he wanted to do, and Elijah would pray, and then it would come to pass. And that, I thought, I never thought about Elijah being an intercessor. <coughs> I hadn't looked very hard, obviously, because when it, he was time for, to rain, he told Elijah, I want to make it rain. But what did Elijah have to do? He had to pray fervently until it rained. So just because God wants to do something on the earth does not mean it's automatically, I don't think, going to happen. I think he wants to incorporate his body to pray that his will comes to pass. Um, and he's, and this, our teacher, Randy Weiss, said, um, especially in these end times, I believe God is raising up intercessors who will discern the will of God that wants to be done on the earth and pray that it comes to pass. And I'm like, that's a thing? That's really real? He, and he said, my wife, Catherine, has that. And I'm like, wow, that's cool. And he kind of elbowed me and said, that's you. I was just blown away. Wow, that's a really real thing, and that's what God wants me to do? This is incredible. So much more than the Galaxy Quest thing. It's so cool. <laughs> so when I, when we came down the mountain, I, I got a little statue of Elijah to remind me that, that it's not the Galaxy Quest lady. It's more like Elijah. <laughs> and when I unpacked it out of my suitcase, the first thing Thaddeus said was, you went all the way to Israel and came back with an idol? <laughs> <laughs> There could be some amazing things that God has called me to that, uh, that I would love to get to. I don't know if I'll ever chase anybody down with swords. So I can't really see myself doing that, but you never know. <laughs> you may not be called to be an intercessor, but I would want to encourage you, whatever it is that you feel like God may be calling you to do, I would encourage you to pursue it because it's going to be amazing and fulfilling and powerful, and it's not going to be um, without difficulty. And you know, the privileged place that we have being pastors is we hear a lot of you guys' stories. And it's hard for me sometimes when you guys come to me with your stories of trials after trials after trials for me to not just kind of smile. Oh, I know that God's got something really good for you because there's no way that he's gonna put you through this without growing something beautiful. So I try not to smile and act like it's not a big deal because I know it is a big deal when you're in the middle of it. But trust me that if God is really putting you through the ringer, he has a plan, and he's going to do something beautiful out of it. He's going to work something, if we let him. If we let him. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention about this whole journey of, of intercession is um, I'm really learning that God really has no need of me. He just has a desire for me. And God really, really illustrated this to me in a really cool way a few weeks ago. Our kids were over at our house, and um, Mackenzie decided she was going to make chocolate chip cookies. I shared this with the ladies Thursday night. And she decided she was going to ask Isla to help her. And now Isla is our little two-year-old granddaughter. Isla, do you want to help me make chocolate chip cookies? Sure. And she's all excited. Nobody needs a two-year-old to help you make chocolate chip cookies. It didn't help Mackenzie at all. Isla's standing up there with an apron that goes down to her feet going, Mommy, look, I'm making cookies. Daddy, look, I make cookies. And all she's doing is eating chocolate chips. Yes. <laughs> all over Papa, look, I'm making chocolate chip cookies. And Mackenzie's just smiling. She's just enjoying so much doing it. Mackenzie didn't need Isla to help her make chocolate chip cookies. She did that because she loves Isla. She loves doing things with Isla because it made Isla happy and it made Mackenzie's time making cookies enjoyable. That's the same way God is with us. I try, try to tell myself it's not that he needs me any more than anybody needs. He's a two-year-old to help you make chocolate chip cookies. It's just that he wants us to participate with him in his kingdom. So he has stuff for us to do that... He doesn't really need us to, but he will use us if we decide to do it. And who knows, Isla may grow up to be a really great cookie baker at some point. 
I've learned that God really, really wants me close to him. And it's not just me, he wants all of us close to him. He's done a lot to ensure that I keep pursuing getting close to him. Um, I have learned that spending time with him is absolutely the most fulfilling thing I have ever experienced in my life. Amen. Back when I used to think, pray all day as an intercessor, how boring. That is not at all what it's like. I, I increasingly over the over the last few years have been adding time to my prayer time just because I don't really feel like it's enough and I have to set my alarm because I will just keep going all morning and when that alarm goes off I hate it. <sighs> do I really have to do this day? Can I just stay here? Because there's there's so much fulfillment and satisfaction in just being with him. And that is the, the absolute joy of being called to be an intercessor is, is being invited to be with him, to be close to him, to hear his heart, to know how he wants you to pray. Um, now I was trying to find a scripture this morning. Um, I was thinking, actually thinking about um, Anna, Anna the prophetess. Remember, um, she was, it, she, she had she was a widow from a really young age, and she spent her t time in the temple praying and worshiping God. And I remember reading that story years ago and thinking that would be really boring. I wouldn't want to just have that job. I could, I could see that I would absolutely love that now if that's what God had for me. And, um, you know, I talked about that that's a thing, the, the, the prayer thing, the knowing what God wants you to do. And, and um, I've learned in, in reading, in studying that in certain circles that there's a name for that. It's called prophetic intercession. Ooh, that sounds really... All it is is knowing what God wants to do and praying that it comes to pass, like the Galaxy Quest lady. It's, um, um, and I think that's probably a lot of what Anna did, because I think Anna probably... It says she was a prophetess, but we don't know what she spoke in prophecy. It could have been that she just discerned the will of God and prayed. I think maybe she was... Uh, her, her and Simeon were two that were ushering in the Messiah, praying until the Messiah showed up. Wouldn't it be cool if maybe I get to be the Anna for the second coming? <laughs> second coming of Christ, that would be really cool. Um, it's an important job. I was thinking about Billy Graham. You know, he, um, he was a great man, but I wondered when he passed away, who were his intercessors? You know God had to call somebody to pray for him in his ministry. Probably his wife, for sure. Maybe his daughter took over when his wife went home. Maybe his, um, maybe his ch children. Maybe, maybe, maybe his parents. Maybe his mother-in-law. Maybe, maybe some little old lady somewhere in North Carolina that nobody's ever heard of. God said, I want you to pray for Billy Graham and his ministry. And she totally was enjoying herself all those years because of the intimacy she, she got to have with God and pray for him. Um, it really doesn't matter what the reward is in heaven because the rewards on earth are good enough as they are. And I'm sure whoever those people are that prayed for him are incredibly rewarded. So I was looking for a scripture to kind of end this with. And um, there have been so many. You should see my Bible highlights and underlines and dates. When the, this spoke to me, when this spoke to me, from, especially from 2014 up till now. Uh, but one that really kind of has been an undercurrent um, that has really been ex encouraging to me, Glenn actually found it in his Bible a couple years ago when we were in the midst of all of this, and he said he had it underlined and he had my name written by it. He doesn't really remember when that happened, and I don't either. But it's um, Jeremiah 33, 3 that says, Call to me, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. So that's it. <laughs> All right, so just as a, a kind of a heads up, your, your testimony grows as you walk. Uh, you know, when God called me to pastor here, um, first I said no. <laughs> um, you know, when God first called me, I was probably five or six. And we were on the base. My dad was in the Navy, and we were driving on the base. And I looked over, and there was a building. And I asked my mom, I said, what is that building? And she said, that's a church. I said, well, what, what do they do there? And she said, well, the, the, at that point, she said the priest. Um, she was not saved yet, but she had grown up a Catholic, so her understanding was, you know, that was the priest. And I said, well, what does he do? And she said, well, he teaches the people about God and... and uh, things like that. And I said, that's what I'm going to be when I grow up. Okay. Now, life intervened. Myself intervened. Um, you know, being a pastor, you got to talk. I thought it was, 
you know, really unusual because I actually at, at one point in high school, my parents sent me to a, a counselor because I didn't talk ever to anyone about anything. Um, you know, the extent of my conversations was, was usually two or three words and that was it. And uh, I had plans, I was going to be the first Van Milk male to become an officer in the Navy. Diabetes took care of that. Um, so my fallback was to go to Bible school. Went to Bible school and met Christy and, and graduated with a degree in Christian ministry with an emphasis in pastoral ministry. And I did everything but. I mean, I, I did, you know, everything from working with an electrician to painting houses to working on computers to running a transcription business. And, and we were always busy in church, but, but never at what I thought God had called me to. And, and when we got to the point, Christy knew long before I did that I was going to be pastor here. Because I'm, I'm very stubborn. If God put two people together, you, you hear the phrase, when an irresistible force meets an immovable object, that's our marriage. Okay, we're very stubborn, we're very strong-willed people. And, you know, Christy is like that irresistible force that just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing, and I'm that immovable object that says I'm not changing. And, well, then God comes in and picks up the rock and moves it where he wants it, and that's me, I'm the rock. Um, when, when God put me here, um, you know, I thought 20 years, wow, okay, 20 years should be enough prep to be a pastor, and I, I'm, I'm still convinced to this day that you should not be a pastor of a church before at least 35, because you don't have enough life experience, okay? I came into the church as a pastor, and then God showed me how much I desperately needed him. I'd gotten comfortable with talking to people. I still remember my family came up to visit, and we went down to Pizza Hut and as a family, and I'm just, I'm talking, I know all the people at Pizza Hut. They know me. We pray for them. And uh, as we are getting ready to leave, my brother looks at me and says, I can't believe you. I tipped. <laughs> he says, no, really. He said, I, you talked to everybody in that store. Said, yeah, I know. He said, you never talked to anybody. <laughs> you know, um, so God prepped me in, in being able to talk with people. But, but when he started revealing to me the, the ugliness and the, the, the st what we call it, that was still in my life, and things that... You know, Christy and I had, had reached a very comfortable place in our relationship. You know, things that needed to be dealt with were either dealt with or stuffed in a closet that said, do not open. And God said, no, we need to pull those things out. And, and God took, God revealed a lot of ugliness in me. And, and for the better part of a year and a half, I was a broken man because I couldn't believe that after all these years of, of following him and serving him that I still could act like this. I could still have this much yuck in my life and, and uh, you know I, I shared with you guys during that time one of the things that God revealed to me was was um, I had made an idol of my my wife and my family and I was worshiping them I was giving them all my energy all my time all my focus and that was supposed to go to God first and and I remember Christy and I had this this discussion where when, when God brings something into your life one perspective of looking at it is it divides your time, it divides your heart. And, but the other way of looking at it is it multiplies your time and it multiplies your heart. Because, you know, we look at it, we go, well, I've only got so many hours in a day. You know, Christy, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brag on Christy a little bit, and I don't do this to diminish her honor before God. But I want you guys to know, um, we, we have a habit that she gets up at least an hour before I do. Because she takes that long to be sociable. <laughs> and I wake up loud. I mean, from the time my eyes open, I'll be singing songs, I'll be talking, I'll ask her questions. She, she's not in the mood for that. And so we had this thing where usually about 45 minutes or so, she would get up before I would so she could go and, and have her quiet time and, and lots of coffee and, and then 
get herself ready for when I woke up. And uh, when God spoke to her that he wanted her getting up earlier to pray, um, she told me that, and I was like, okay, that's fine. And, and she, she went gung-ho at it. Well, as she has been called to this ministry, um, she's, she's gotten up earlier and earlier. Well, when God called us to do the 21 days of prayer here at the church, um, that meant she had to get up between 3 and 3.30. And every morning, but there were often times that I had just fallen asleep. And then the alarm starts going off. It's like, really? Wow, okay. And she was faithful to get up each morning and pray. Um, she still is getting up. She's usually up between 5 and 5.30 so that she can spend time in the Word, spend time in prayer, spend time praying for people that God lays on her heart. A lot of you guys have received texts from her as a direct result of that time in prayer where God will just speak something to her and, and she'll just say, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. I'm, I'm lifting you up to the throne. And, um, you know, she says that I'm a, a man of commitment. Um, I, I don't know a lot about love. I don't understand a lot about the emotions. I don't, I'm not really a romantic person. But I do understand that when you say I do, you're, you're I do till you're done. And that done is in the grave or called home. And, and, there were times when that was really tested because one of the things that I always said is divorce is not an option, divorce is not an option, divorce is not an option. God put us through the ringer and then pulled us back through to make sure we were fully done. <laughs> and, and so I want to encourage you. Those years were ugly, but they were also some of the best years ever because we had a desperate, desperate need for God. Um, and he showed up. Sometimes not in the moment. Sometimes I was too loud in the moment to hear him. Because all I'm doing is yelling, God help me, God help me, God help me. God has given us many children, both biologically and, and by marriage and by adoption. And I tell you what, I don't want to say I take pride, but I'm well pleased with the relationship that my children have with God because at different points, they would come to us and speak life into what we felt like was death. And they would bring light and hope into what we felt like it was just, just despair. So, um, you know, as part of your testimony, it should grow. It should grow. It should change. It should, should become more. Because God is never idle in our lives. There are seasons of, of, of pushing forward and there are seasons of, of rest. But God is always active in our life. He's always doing something. So uh, I'm going to leave it there. Um, we were supposed to start Yom Kippur. I'm actually going to put Yom Kippur off until April because I really feel like God wants to take us on a journey uh, coming up to the Resurrection Sunday, to, to Good Friday, to Seder, and then to First Fruits. And so we're, we're going to take the next few weeks and we're going to come on a journey um, just walking with Jesus as he looked forward to what was to come. So we're, we're going to, uh, we're not going to start Yom Kippur. I did make copies of all of my notes from the introduction uh, to the feasts all the way up to um, Rosh Hashanah. They're over there if you would like them. Um, I didn't make very many copies because I don't want to throw a lot of paper away. So if you, if you need a particular copy that's not there, let me know. I can make you a copy. Uh, I would encourage you, though, over the course of this week or this month, start investing yourself in Scripture. Start looking at the Day of Atonement. Start looking at what God is speaking for prophetically that we look forward to in the Day of Atonement. All right?